Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is one in a series of virtual sessions the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of our seventh annual Columbia Global Energy Summit. My name is David Sandalow. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy and co-director of the Energy Environment Concentration at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University. This event's being webcast live. The full video will be available online later today. And, and today I am especially honored to be joined by His Excellency, Dr. Sultan El Jaber. Dr. El Jaber is CEO of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC. He's Minister for Industry and Advanced Technology of the United Arab Emirates. He's Chairman of the Renewable Energy Investor, Mazdar, and the UAE Special Envoy for Climate Change. That makes you a very busy man, Dr. El Jaber. We're really honored that you're able to join us. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, David, for the introduction and for the opportunity. Uh, I must say that I am actually very pleased and happy to see you again. And I hope that you and your family and colleagues are all safe and well. Uh, please uh, do send my best wishes uh, to my very dear friend, Jason Bordoff, and the whole leadership of the Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy. And uh, regarding uh, uh, the, the opportunity to meet with you today, uh, it is indeed a, a very timely uh, session, and I am very much uh, looking forward to a very uh, fruitful discussion with you. Well, thank you. I, I remember well one of one of my last trips before the world shut down for the pandemic was to Abu Dhabi, where you received us very warmly, and we're very grateful for the hospitality uh, that you showed us, and, and for all you've done over the years in energy uh, and, and in clean energy in particular. Um, I'm always happy but, to see you. Sir. So we have a lot to discuss, particularly with all of your roles, uh, Dr. Al Jaber. Let, let's start with oil demand. Um, and it's been, it's been quite a year in the oil markets with this historic collapse in demand just over a year ago, followed by a recovery in some countries. Um, now some analysts are predicting a spike in oil prices due to underinvestment in the past year. Do you see, do you see such a spike? spike in oil prices coming in either in the short or the medium term? And, and more broadly, what do you see as the outlook for oil demand in the years ahead? David, on the global economic outlook, uh, the ramp up in vaccination programs around the world is very much encouraging. And uh, as you can see, the economic landscape uh, is looking quite positive. Uh, economic activity is already picking up pace uh, as life begins to return to something closer to normal. And as a result, we are seeing a healthy rebalancing of oil markets. Today, uh, demand is currently back up to 95 million bar barrels per day. And uh, our longer term forecast has demand increasing to 106 million barrels per day by 2030. And to your question uh, about the risk of underinvestment, the oil and gas industry as a whole has in fact significantly reduced investments over the past five years. And the reasons for this underinvestment are in fact pretty clear. Uh, there have been two major concerns uh, or two major corrections uh, in oil prices since 2016 reinforcing uh, capital discipline uh, like never before. As a result, uh, low cost uh, producers are at a distinct advantage uh, in an environment where efficiency is extremely critical and in fact, very, very important. At the same time, we are also seeing global investors motivated by ESG concerns. Uh, most are moving away from carbon intensive barrels and toward less carbon intensive uh, barrels. By this measure, the UAE uh, as a major oil producing nation and with our primary crude grade Marban, which is known to be one of the least uh, carbon intensive in the world, uh, this creates, this helps create a, a dual advantage for us as a low cost and low carbon uh, producer. So in a world 
that needs more energy with fewer emissions, we here in ADNOC uh, are stepping up. Uh, we're committing over 120 billion US dollars over the next five years to expand our low carbon crude capacity. And as we expand capacity, we will go further to drive down our operational carbon intensity, uh, targeting an additional 25% reduction by 2030. Uh, Dr. Al-Jabri, one interesting feature of the answer you just gave is the, the central role of carbon emissions and decarbonization, um, as you spoke. And it, I, I note that, that among the jobs that you hold right now, you are both CEO of one of the world's major oil companies, ADNAC. You're also the special climate envoy for the United Arab Emirates. I, I think there are people in the world who might find the combination of those two jobs surprising. Um, how, can you talk about how you think about the two jobs going together, um, in both you know, in your diplomatic role and then the role of you know, oil companies uh, in, this, in this arena? That's actually a great question, uh, David, and uh, I do hear this question very often. I think that having uh, an understanding of the entire uh, energy system is indeed uh, valuable to a productive conversation uh, about addressing climate change. Uh, I think I find it to be an advantage, in fact. This is particularly important as the energy transition is exactly that. It is simply a transition where oil and gas will continue to play a major role alongside a diversifying energy mix. So understanding how each piece of the extended energy value chain fits together and complements each other is very important to meet energy demand sustainably and of course economically. In the UAE, we believe that focusing on low carbon production while proactively diversifying our energy mix is the responsible way forward. And this can in fact provide new economic opportunities. And this is exactly what we see here in the UAE. So using this approach, the UAE uh, has grown its renewable investments from a low base about 15 years ago to a leading position uh, in the region today. And thanks uh, to the visionary uh, leadership of the United Arab Emirates, the UAE today has three of the largest and lowest cost solar projects in the world with significant renewable energy projects in more than 30 countries uh, around the world. And in order to accelerate our progress on a lower carbon path, we need to leverage every clean energy source available. And we do that by tapping into wind resources, solar, and of course, uh, other uh, renewable energy uh, sources. This approach or this comprehensive uh, approach means also using nuclear energy. And as you know, the United Arab Emirates is the first country in the Middle East to bring zero carbon nuclear energy online. And as a result, uh, and this was very much due uh, to the one, two, three agreement uh, with the United States. And I do remember many conversations I had with you over the past few years uh, in regards to that agreement. And I thank all of those in the US that played a role uh, in helping us achieve such an important milestone. Uh, and finally, on top of all these existing sources, we need to explore new energies such as hydrogen. Uh, and I can comfortably tell you that we in ADNOC have a very unique position to leverage our existing vast resources of gas, uh, our gas infrastructure to develop uh, a very unique positioning in the blue, hyd blue hydrogen space. Uh, of course, in addition, we are also exploring green hydrogen through the Abu Dhabi Hydrogen Alliance. And we are working diligently uh, with many uh, of our existing partners, as well as new partners around the world to identify new market opportunities. We're mapping out value chains and we're developing a very clear, robust uh, business development roadmap to create a hydrogen ecosystem to serve both the UAE 
and the global marketplace. You, Dr. El Jabra, you refer to blue hydrogen, and that that implies use of carbon capture and storage. What what are your thoughts broadly on carbon capture and storage? We are big supporters of uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, as you know, uh, we are a, a major oil producing nation that, that have adopted uh, carbon capture technology way before everyone. We already capture 800,000 tons uh, of carbon and we transport it through uh, a carbon uh, pipeline to one of our depleted oil wells. And to us, uh, it's a win-win-win. We reduce carbon emissions, we generate carbon credits. At the same time, we liberate gas for other utilizations and we enhance oil recovery. So we are big believers of uh, carbon capture and storage and we believe it is going to be one big meaningful way if we're serious about reducing carbon emissions and, ad and addressing uh, climate change. You know, I'd like, I'd like to note at the Center on Global, en Global Energy Policy, we're doing a lot of work on hydrogen and on zero carbon fuels and um, look for more in this space because it's such an important topic for, for the years ahead. Um, to, back to your role as, as a, a climate diplomat, in addition to running a, a major oil company, uh, I noted that the last uh, month UAE participated, you know, very, very actively in President Biden's climate summit. Um, and if, uh, so a few, I'd like to ask a few questions about that and about the kind of lead up to that. First, th there was an announcement there that, that I think got some attention from, it was, I think, surprising to some people that the UAE and the United States government jointly announced a, a program on agricultural innovation called the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate. And I think, you know, the UAE is not usually thought of as an agricultural nation. I wonder what, what was behind the UAE's leadership role on that and what is the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate? Good question. And I've been asked this question uh, many times since we made this announcement with our colleagues in the United States of America uh, on the sidelines of the Biden summit. The fact is, David, uh, the UAE has always taken a holistic view when it comes to climate solutions. And agriculture is sometimes overlooked uh, as a significant source of emissions. In fact, uh, it is an area that needs addressing as much as uh, the way we address energy systems. Nearly a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. That is basically the same greenhouse gas contribution as electricity generation. This is one of the reasons why the UAE joined uh, with the US and uh, a growing coalition of countries to launch this very special initiative. Uh, the Aim for Climate uh, initiative is a global initiative. Uh, it currently includes nine countries uh, and which we are confident will only expand uh, in preparation of uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, the aim here is to increase R&D investment and, of course, accelerate innovation into sustainable agricultural practices and, uh, in a way, contribute to ensure that we are able to feed a growing global population with fewer uh, environmental impacts. And the UAE, as a country in an arid part of the world, we are already leveraging new technologies and many innovative approaches to enable sustainable farming in desert conditions. Uh, we believe that by doubling down uh, on investment in uh, 4IR technologies, the fourth industrial uh, revolution technologies, we can help the agricultural sector adapt to the impacts of climate change, uh, even reduce carbon emissions and support growth, uh, support uh, new opportunities and job creation uh, in a very important emerging agri-tech sector. Uh, I think you know that I am a big proponent of the view that tackling the climate change agenda should be viewed as an opportunity for, grow for economic growth. It is uh, something that I uh, very much support. Uh, it is something I personally believe in. Uh, and I don't believe uh, in any way or shape that addressing uh, climate is a burden uh, that needs to be managed. I think it is an opportunity that needs to be capitalized on. And we will seek out opportunities uh, throughout this whole uh, engagement 
for sustainable economic growth uh, in every sector we get involved in. Uh, so, well, thank you for that, Dr. Sultan. Uh, and uh, continuing on questions about about the uh, the Biden Climate Summit, um, before, right before the Climate Summit, Secretary Kerry, I believe, was in the UAE. Um, and there was a regional climate dialogue that brought together 10 countries in the region, um, along with Alok Sharma, the president of COP26. Um, you just talk about what's happening in the region on climate change, um, connections with oil, you know, oil production, and, and the significance of that gathering. That meeting was, in fact, a, a very important milestone. It was uh, very much conducted in preparation of the Biden summit. Uh, that dialogue was significant, uh, in my view, in a couple of ways. It aligned two major hydrocarbon producers, the UAE and the US, on a shared agenda to turn climate action into a real, true economic opportunity. The dialogue, uh, as you know, also convened 10 regional economies uh, together with the leadership of COP26, uh, and the International Renewable Energy Agency in a very productive, meaningful discussion that also produced concrete, uh, real, tangible results. The outcomes were a combined commitment uh, to increasing investment in renewable energy uh, and uh, technologies that can help mitigate climate change in the region and beyond. Uh, ultimately, the key takeaway from our meeting was Progressive uh, climate action is not only necessary, it can also be a true powerful economic driver. Uh, and we all agreed that if we do it right, it can actually put the world on a new low carbon, high growth development trajectory. And this is what the whole world needs today, especially in the post COVID uh, era. Uh, one powerful data point that demonstrates that this is the growth, uh, the, the real and actual growth of installed renewable energy in 2020 uh, did actually set a record uh, despite the economic headwinds of COVID-19. In mm -hmm. fact, $300 billion were invested in the renewable space only last year, a 50% increase uh, on 2019. These are real, true, hard facts that should make us all optimistic about the future of sustainable economic development. In short, the regional dialogue reinforced the positive global momentum around progressive climate action and the underscored role uh, of the UAE uh, and its ability to convene and enable real progress in a very important area like climate change. Dr. Sotan, following up on that, we actually have a, we have a question in the chat from someone you know well, Nabuo Tanaka, a global leader on these issues. And, and you mentioned hydrogen and, and uh, Mr. Tanaka asked whether you think a golden age of hydrogen is coming. Um, what, are, uh, what, what are your thoughts generally on, on hydrogen's potential? What I can comfortably tell you is that Asia is going to be one big important market uh, for hydrogen. And as such, uh, I can comfortably say that we, ha we are already uh, engaged in uh, very meaningful uh, discussions uh, with existing partners as well as with new partners across uh, Asia. Uh, and the discussion is centered around either market opportunities or technology or joint investments. Well, and so, so then back to, to climate diplomacy, um, uh, big meeting coming up this year um, in Glasgow, um, uh, COP26. Um, what are your expectations for the Glasgow Climate Conference? And, and what do you think needs to happen for the Glasgow Conference to be a success? That is a very important uh, milestone in the whole climate action uh, process. Uh, I am cautiously and quietly optimistic about the potential for COP26 to be a real success. Uh, mostly because of what I mentioned earlier, uh, and that is I believe that the world understands 
that progressive climate action is an opportunity for real economic growth, uh, especially coming off the back of uh, post-COVID uh, recovery. So we need uh, new economic development programs to cater for speedy uh, recovery after uh, the COVID experience. Uh, what I find uh, encouraging is that it is not only governments that get, a, that get this right now, uh, but the broader business community across uh, public and private sector, industrial sector, uh, everyone is on board. You have basically got everyone on the same page today, which was not necessarily the case a few years ago. Uh, now, will there be points of negotiation between countries and between regions at COP26? Of course, uh, absolutely. So I expect healthy discussion. Uh, I expect a meaningful debate, but I fundamentally believe that we can accelerate progress on climate change if we avoid one size fits all policies. We need to customize our approach for different regions. Uh, we need to ensure that emissions are reduced without handicapping economic growth in developing economies. Uh, for instance, Africa shouldn't pay the price for the industrial revolution that helped mature many economies get to the level of development that they enjoy today. So we need to get the right balance in terms of policy, uh, climate finance, and agreed targets. And on that specific point, I should note that the UAE recently announced its second nationally determined contribution, uh, the NDC, making it the first country in the region to commit to an economy-wide reduction in emissions compared to business as usual. And I think every country will come to Glasgow with a mindset to make Glasgow an important step forward. So I am sure uh, that everyone will come with genuine interests to make Glasgow a success. Ultimately, I think willingness is there to take a, grab, a great uh, leap forward at Glasgow. And the UAE is more than willing to play its role as a regional leader and a global convener in progressing uh, the discussion around climate action. Uh, well, Dr. al um, I know you, you told us uh, you're gonna need to um, go a bit earlier than originally planned, which is not surprising for somebody with four major jobs like, like you've got, uh, given the pressures on your schedule. Uh, as, as we draw to a close, I just wanna ask if there's any other points that you'd like to share with our audience or any reflections on any of the items we covered or anything I didn't ask where, that you'd like to make sure we address today. I just want to uh, uh, again remind everyone uh, that we uh, are genuinely keen and uh, interested in playing an, uh, our responsible role in the global energy markets. And uh, in the climate change space, uh, we do see a true real economic opportunity and we are extending our arms uh, as an open invitation to the world to join hands with the UAE uh, to, uh, to identify new investment opportunities, new technologies that we can advance uh, in an effort to help uh, address the climate change. And uh, at the same time, uh, I thank you very much, David, for the opportunity. And I hope that we can meet uh, soon and in person, uh, either here or in, uh, here in Abu Dhabi or in New York, or uh, I'm sure we'll be able to meet in Glasgow. Well, thank you. I, I'm looking forward to that. And for those watching online, my name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. We've been joined by His Excellency, Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al Jaber, CEO of the Abu Dhabi Abu Dhabi National Oil Company and the UAE's Special Envoy for Climate Change, among, among other jobs. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for joining us today. We're really honored that you were you did this. And um, as mentioned, the uh, the video, uh, the full video of this event is going to be available online, Center on Global Energy Policy's website and YouTube later today. Uh, the next session of the seventh annual Columbia Global Energy Summit. Um, which is Innovating for the Planet, the Power of Technology and Finance, will be held at 12 o'clock Eastern time today uh, in about 90 minutes. Uh, for a full calendar of our upcoming events, please visit the Center on Global Energy Policy's website 
and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.